Hi, so welcome back everyone and I hope you managed to uh, enjoy your short break. Uh, so we're joined again by Professor Baer um, who's going to talk to us about a controversial condition regardless of his name and, and very much very looking much forward to his lecture. lecture. So, so without further ado, Professor Baer, over to you. Great, I hope you can uh, hear me, see me and my slides. We can indeed. Great, OK, so um, uh, I'm, I'm really going to disappoint you, Chris, because it is another long winded presentation. So my apologies for that, but you've asked me to put Brigada syndrome into 20 minutes and you know that's going to be impossible for me. <laughs> anyway, I'll do my best. So um, let's put Brigada syndrome into context. We estimate that there are around 50 to 100,000 uh, sudden cardiac deaths per annum in the UK, and that is just an estimate because we have no really robust ways of measuring that. The um, uh, scientific literature and the consensus statements have suggested that around 4% of all sudden cardiac deaths should be due to Brigada syndrome. That would estimate around two to, to 4,000 per annum. Um, now, I'm not sure we could say that we've seen that many patients coming in with cardiac arrest to a Brigada syndrome that would equate to two, two to 4,000 per annum. But uh, anyway, it gives you an idea that it, it is a potentially important part of a sudden cardiac death not related to um, common causes such as coronary artery disease. Um, the estimated incidence varies, however, um, internationally, uh, and so you can have rates of around five to 66 per 100,000 per annum, while the rates of um, uh, the rates of death per annum in Laos are one in a thousand in young males from uh, Brigada syndrome, um, and this is where it's most representative. So it's a um, um, it is a, uh, a potentially important condition uh, in at least in the Southeast Asian countries, where its incidence is very high amongst young males. Um, as a condition, it's a, a primary. Uh, it's always thought of being uh, of being a, a a primary electrical disorder. And I think you may have had some um, um, some evidence from uh, animal studies presented by uh, uh, Mark Spectrum earlier on around the ECG in ion channelopathies and the relationship of the pathophysiology of Brigada syndrome suggesting it is a, a repolarization abnormality. Um, there are, however, uh, more data to suggest that there are subtle structural abnormalities and allowing it. And I'm going to show you that end of the spectrum of pathophysiology, but it is predominantly an ECG diagnosis of J point and ST elevation in the right ventricular leads. That's characteristic type, type one ECG pattern code for the T wave inversion that can occur spontaneously, uh, either persistently or transiently and dynamically. If you remember, I mentioned to you earlier about the possibility of a burden of uh, a type one pattern on a halter monitor. Or it may be provoked, in which case that may be by the, the Ashmolean provocation test or by uh, fever, high body temperature can also provoke it. And there's the characteristic of variable penetrance whereby family members who seem to carry the same condition may show it differently um, and have variable expression of their or differences in expression of the same disorder. This is an example of uh, different ECG type patterns, uh, ECG patterns in Brigada syndrome in the setting of a partial right bundle branch block. And here you'll see the type one pattern the J point and COVID yes, elevation at the end of the uh, right bundle branch block pattern. But if you're getting the partial right bundle with a saddle shaped ST segment, it can be described particularly if the R prime is broad as a type two pattern um, over here, or if there's no ST elevation, the type three pattern. And these can actually be normal findings if you um, elevate the ECG leads in V1 and V2 to the third or second intercostal spaces and the high precordial lead positions that we've mentioned before. And the other method for diagnosis other than spontaneous change was sodium channel blocker challenge. And here you'll see three minutes into that one milligram per kilogram, uh, five minute uh, protocol um, of um, uh, Ashmolean provocation. In fact, I think this is my first ever Ashmolean test in 99. Um, and here you can see, um, I, thankfully it was actually uh, interestingly enough, it was positive and uh, not thankfully, but interestingly enough, it was positive. Um, and you will see very clear development, the type one pattern there. So in terms of diagnosis, historically, the diagnosis of Brigada syndrome 
was um, uh, thought to be or, or given as by consensus a type one pattern in more than one, so two or more right ventricular leads V1 to V3, uh, with or without a sodium channel blocker, so spontaneously or without a sodium channel blocker, plus one of either documenta documented prior VF or polymorphic VT, a family history of sudden cardiac death, other type 1 ECG patterns, inducibility of ventricular arrhythmias at EP or sustained polymorphic ET VF at EP studies uh, and arrhythmic syncope, or nocturnal agonal respiration suggestive of nocturnal arrhythmias. Um, if it was uh, a type 2 or 3 pattern converting to a type 1 with the sodium channel blocker, this was considered type 1 equivalent, but if it was isolated, it was the idiopathic Brugada ECG pattern, not Brugada syndrome. Now, some changes occurred subsequently. It was determined that um, uh, by a, a number of different publications that placing leads V1 and V2 in the second and third intercostal spaces, the high precordial lead positions, increased sensitivity without reducing specificity for Brugada syndrome because of the location of the right ventricular outflow tract in relation to um, the um, sternum and the RVOT is where we think the, um, the substrate resides. V3 also turned out to be vestigial in that it never seemed to be positive um, when, the, uh, when the others were negative, so it never added anything more. Um, and it led to the HRS era APHRS statement in 2013 that you've seen mention of from uh, Mike earlier, that the Brigada syndrome uh, would be diagnosed if you have that type one pattern in one or more, so not two or more, but one or more, of the uh, six leads positioned in V1, V2, second, third, or fourth intercostal spaces, either spontaneously or after provocative drug test. This was to try and bring them in line with long QT syndrome. Either you've got a long QT or you've got a, a Brigada pattern. Um, why, do you, why do you call one syndrome and the other not syndrome? And that was part of the rationale. Um, and the other uh, proviso was that a type two or type three pattern uh, with Ashmaline could do the same um, um, uh, or provocative drug testing with other sodium channel blockers could do the same in terms of initiating a Brigada syndrome diagnosis. It became evident, however, that we made a mistake there. Um, when uh, patients with AV nodal range from tachycardia and healthy controls underwent Ashmaline provocation twen testing 27% of patients with the AVNRT and four and a half percent of, of apparently healthy control subjects had a type one Brigada ECG pattern with Ashwin provocation testing based on those criteria, predominantly in the high leads and um, uh, involving one lead or more. And subsequent to that as well, fever provocation, always thought to be a marker for higher risk, was actually studied systematically in the emergency department patients attending uh, in, in, attending, uh, in Israel. And the febrile group was thought uh, of febrile patients um, was found to have a, um, were found to have a 2% prevalence of the type one pattern in those same ECG lead positions compared to 0.1% in afebrile pa patients, 0.1% therefore being more akin to the rare syndrome that we, uh, we are expecting Brigada to be and therefore um, really throwing to doubt whether a fever induced and an Ashmaline induced pattern really indicated Brigada syndrome or not. And so this J-Wave syndromes document was um, produced um, as an expert consensus in 2017 in Europace and Heart Rhythm, saying that at least you should have the, uh, with a drug induced type one pattern, some other factor that would support um, the diagnosis of Brigada reverting very much to what was proposed in 2002-2005 and indeed they uh, went on to give a scoring uh, system very much like the Schwartz score whereby if you have three and a half or more points you have a probable or definite diagnosis of Brigada syndrome um, but if you uh, had a fever induced or a drug induced pattern you didn't have automatically have a diagnosis and you'll see here they use 12 lead and ambulatory um, monitors as the um, as the diagnostic criterion. So 12 lead holds monitors would also be acceptable there. You'll see the fever and uh, and drug challenge uh, got different 
points. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with that, but that's what they proposed. Um, the clinical history, uh, in addition to those other factors I mentioned, they've got varying levels of scoring. So cardiac arrest clearly scores very highly, but you also have something there um, that's relatively novel, premature atrial flutteral fibrillation um, would score half a point. And in terms of family history, um, SADS, uh, unexplained sudden cardiac death, gets a little bit of a score there, half a point. Again, I'm not sure I agree that half a point is sufficient, but um, again, this is not a gold standard. This is a scoring system, and it's very, it's very unclear how one validates this other than it being useful. In terms of the underlying genetics for what we consider to be a, a heritable disorder in many families, many genes have been associated with Regarda syndrome in the literature. The sodium channel gene is the most common and in the largest compendia would suggest around one in five um, prevalence for SCN5A um, variation in cases. Um, all those genes show a number of different uh, 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 possible pathophysiological effects, reduction of inward sodium current or exacerbation of outward uh, potassium currents or occasionally inward calcium current, but the rest of them are generally rare based on the basic EP studies, few with linkage data, and in fact, many of these genetic variants um, that underpinned these paper were not actually that rare in the general population and certainly not rare enough to be causative of a rare form of Brigada syndrome. And so when the statistical studies of burden were undertaken, so comparing cases of Brigada with cases of control and saying uh, how what genes appear to be enriched a rare genetic variation that could be causative of the condition. The only gene that came out was the sodium channel gene as being significant. And when these uh, all 21 of these genes, in fact, were all there are more, of course, in the literature now. But when 21 of these were reappraised by the uh, uh, Clinical Genome Initiative, um, the ClinGen Initiative uh, set of experts reviewed them and found that only SCN5A had strong enough diagnosis to be used as a definitive diagnostic uh, gene test and therefore have a role for clinical testing. But the original evidence for SCN5A was also based on uh, basic EP data um, showing uh, in vitro reduction of inward sodium current that was temperature dependent, hence the importance of pyrexia, uh, high body temperature, further exacerbating the loss of sodium current and reduction of inward um, uh, conduction, uh, inward sodium currents and conduction velocities. But there weren't any linkage data in that original study. And if you look at large numbers um, of large families, you start to find genotype phenotype mismatch. Um, and so that uh, you were in this particular early study from over 10 years ago now from Nantes and, and uh, Dutch groups and Amsterdam groups, they had uh, 13 large families in whom eight individuals showed a Brigada syndrome ECG, but uh, didn't carry the sodium channel mutation in those large sodium channel families. Um, and most of the time that was linked to having ashmaline as a provocative test, which may indicate to you how that ashmaline may not be uh, a perfect diagnostic test as well. The mutation carriers though had longer QRS and PR intervals, so they had more conduction disease, should be in keeping with the uh, uh, the slowed conduction and um, uh, a, a physiology of some of these uh, sense variants, um, and it's thought that it was thought therefore that mutations uh, in sodium channel genes may play uh, in the sodium channel gene may play a modifier role in some families rather than being directly causative, and so there was evidence also from the Dutch group that the type of SCN5A variants may determine the clinical severity and degree of conduction abnormality. So truncating versus uh, missense um, uh, variants. Uh, comparing these showed longer PR intervals and more marked um, response to sodium channel blocker with PR and QRS, although I wouldn't recommend giving sodium channel blockers necessarily in these patients. And there was a higher frequency of syncope in this retrospective analysis. Um, we've done our own work looking at uh, a greater range of sodium channel variants, and we found that the uh, the rarer the the um, type of one pattern was more likely present um, in families where there was more a more severe 
uh, variant present. So if you look at E1784K, which is the most common sodium channel variant present in long QT and Brigada syndrome families, uh, it's actually quite a mild uh, variant in phenotype in its, um, uh, in its presentation. And it, it had a relatively low likelihood of a type 1 pattern being associated with its presence in a family member compared to um, truncating variants and other types of missense variants where the odds ratio was much higher. And so the question then arises, what is the missing heritability for uh, Brigada syndrome um, if genetic variants and rare genetic variants are, are, are not present in the majority um, uh, and, um, and we've discounted many of the other genes involved? And so genome-wide association studies have been undertaken where cases, Brigada syndrome cases and controls are compared across the genome for locations um, that are, are, are labeled uh, with uh, specific uh, SNPs, these are single nucleotide polymorphisms, common variants that label the regions of the genome and those that seem to be more strongly associated with the condition versus um, the healthy control maybe those that are associated with the, um, uh, the condition and could even be causative of the condition. And it was found that there were three loci present, two here in chromosome three and one here in chromosome six um, that were associated with the Brigada syndrome. And these, um, well, these findings were replicated in, uh, in a larger Caucasian group and Japanese patients and a polygenic risk score, a combination of SNPs and their effects uh, was um, uh, constructed showing that if you had uh, more than uh, four, so five to six alleles of this um, uh, of these particular SNPs, so each SNP will have an a uh, two alleles. If you have six of the risk alleles, then you have at least a twenty um, odd, an odds ratio of twenty, a twentyfold higher likelihood of Cambridge-Brigada syndrome than not, um, based on this case control analysis. And this was confirmed in the Japanese as well. This was also then validated in Taiwanese and Thai populations, so this appears to be an important driver to the genetic risk for Brigada, but not on the basis of Mendelian genetics, but on polygenic heritability. And we've looked at this in sodium channel families, and we found that it seems to increase the likelihood of showing Brigada phenotype, even in those who carry already a relatively strong sodium channel variants. Um, but in the genotype negative in whom Ashwellian provocation is diagnosed um, Brigada syndrome, they have a high polygenic risk score um, or much like it, more likely to have a high polygenic risk score. So a 23 odds ratio there in genotype negative individuals, which may explain that early finding of why some genotype and negative individuals have a positive phenotype for Brigada. And more recently just published has been another even larger uh, GWAS showing nine additional loci giving 21 different SNPs that will uh, allow further optimization of risk scores so we can really try and see whether diagnosis can be achievable using polygenic risk scores. And the model therefore is, um, uh, is uh, one of a disease or phenotype threshold that needs to be breached before the type one pattern will be shown. And the disease susceptibility increases the stronger the, uh, the genetic susceptibility is. And so if you have a Mendelian a condition um, that it has a high penetrance, then all you need is uh, one rare variant, one mutation to develop the condition. If uh, you have a strong variant, but you need a few additional SNPs, then that's a near Mendelian or oleg oligogenic condition. And, and there you may have those loss of function, truncating sodium channel alleles, you only need a small polygenic risk score to, to pop you over the threshold to getting Brigada. But if you have a weaker variant such as E1784K, you may have additional lower frequency variants which are not really well understood yet, and those SNPs on top of them to achieve that disease threshold. So that's the oligogenic and polygenic models for Brigada uh, genetic susceptibility. Um, now I'm going to um, quickly talk to you about pathophysiology. Um, we early on um, in uh, the last decade uh, became aware that many Brigada syndrome patients had an underlying uh, epicardial abnormality in the right ventricular outflow tract that rather than indicating a pure repolarization abnormality, 
had evidence of significant conduction abnormalities with these low amplitude signals over here um, that are fractionated um, and uh, when ablated, the Brigada ECG pattern is removed and uh, rock, uh, patient um, shocks are reduced as well. And it's been confirmed by multiple other centers in multiple studies. Um, open heart epicardial ablation undertaken in these patients uh, is one way to approach those patients who don't have ready um, epicardial access. And if we've, we were able to study some of these and find that the locations with epicardial uh, abnormalities, these complex fractionated potential indicating slow conduction, when biopsied had evidence of epicardial fibrosis and epicardial and focal replacement fibrosis in the underlying myocardium. And Chris Miles, our, one of our chairs today, has undertaken a study in Mary's um, uh, lab looking at cases of um, Brigada syndrome from uh, either an anti-mortem diagnosis or familial diagnosis or, or, or causative sodium channel mutations um, compared to controls with non-cardiac uh, deaths and digitally quantified collagen in these cases and fat, although fat was irrelevant. But what he showed um, uh, in greater detail than we've previously been able to see is that there is a high proportion of collagen in the right ventricular outflow tract, highest in that region of the heart and highest in Brigada cases compared to controls, and that there's an increase in collagen in general in controls uh, in Brigada cases compared to controls, but also affecting the left ventricle and rest of the right ventricle. It's suggesting that collagen is a really important factor um, in, in, in Brigada pathogenesis and understanding where that comes from is going to be critical to understanding um, how Brigada uh, comes about. Um, and we also were able to demonstrate that this seemed um, to be present in cases who had uh, pathogenic sodium channel mutations and those who didn't. And so this could be a consistent finding across the board throughout all Brigada cases. Um, but really uh, also in cases where we had a familial diagnosis male after SADS, uh, we also saw this increase in collagen proportion. So this appears to be consistent across potential sudden death patients. So um, in, uh, uh, in conclusion, Brigada syndrome behaves often like a monogenic disease. Most rare variation is not strictly causative and common variation is important. Therefore, it is polygenic and patients need to be counseled carefully. scn 5 a variation suggests a higher risk of conduction disease and could be useful prognostically, particularly given the increased risk of syncope in some recent Japanese data. Um, the variant severity associates with phenotype and the polygenic risk score also associate with phenotype. And we need to explore these uh, uh, for their role in diagnose, diagnosis and outcomes of potentially how that links to underlying increase in collagen content and the right ventricular outflow tract uh, substrate. And further studies therefore require to elucidate that underlying mechanism. Now, I've got to over 20 minutes in my talk and I haven't been able to talk about management yet. So Chris, would you like me to stop there? Um, um, there's OK, because uh, I, I will touch on management there. Um, if you're interested, then the um, uh, I would I'll suggest you go and look at this um, this opinion piece um, that I penned with colleagues um, from uh, across the world in 2021 about impaired right ventricular outflow tract conduction reserve um, and its potential role and contributors to that and the induction of the Brigada phenotype. So have a look at that if you're interested in the pathophysiology of Brigada. Um, in terms of prognosis, the original ideas around Brigada syndrome was that it had a terrible prognosis, um, that there was cardiac arrest uh, amongst the 20% uh, within one year and 40% in four years. And there was no difference between symptomatic and asymptomatic patients and only the ICD was protective. Uh, uh, drug therapy wasn't. Now, the larger studies then came through and showed a different finding. That was initial referral center bias from the regard of brothers' initial experience. Um, and these findings from 2010 still really stand the test of time. So um, this is uh, work from uh, the Dutch, the Germans, um, uh, and the French combining their data showing that asymptomatic patients had the lowest risk of uh, half a percent per annum risk of sudden cardiac death or ICD shock. Patients with arrhythmic syncope had a 2% risk per annum, 
by around an 8% risk per annum for those who have resuscitated sudden cardiac death. And so, in terms of management of regardless syndrome, there's a very complex but actually dissectable algorithm that's in that original um, uh, J-Wave syndrome paper that I mentioned to you earlier, the new consensus statement. And I think the, the, guide, the management guidelines here are very uh, reasonable. If you are symptomatic with electrical storm, oops, excuse me, it's decided to do its thing, electrical storm or prior cardiac arrest, clearly an ICD implant is class one indication. But don't forget to um, address the lifestyle measures. Avoid drugs that uh, are sodium channel blocking, that induce or aggravate ST segment elevation, avoiding cocaine and excessive alcohol intake, and some would add cannabis to that as well as potential exacerbants. I don't know why my slides want to move on. And treat fever with antipyretic drugs. Um, now, if somebody has a rhythmic syncope um, in the setting of Brigada pattern, then it's a class 2A indication, so uh, uh, should be considered, particularly if it's presumably arrhythmic in origin. And if not, then considering close follow-up with or without an ILR. So symptoms are okay, but most patients are without symptoms in Brigada syndrome. Um, and so if we look maybe at ECG appearance, you'll see we don't get much benefits in terms of dissecting risk out unless we look at the asymptomatic patient with a drug-induced type 1 pattern. They're having a very low risk of events, while a spontaneous type 1 pattern had a higher risk, but still not significant enough to immediately implant an ICD, so 0.8% per annum risk. So there's always been an ongoing desire to understand how to risk stratify the asymptomatic patient for primary prevention. And EP studies to induce sustained VT or VF, polymorphic VT or VF, of, so that's over 30 seconds, an EP study was a class 2A indication in original consensus recommendations for ICD implantation. But um, the, uh, the uh, Brigada brothers' experience compared to other studies from other colleagues really showed a very different understanding. They had good positive and, uh, and uh, negative predictive values while um, the conversion of EPS positives to spontaneous VF events in other studies from other centers was much less satisfying with a very poor specificity and poor positive predictive value. And there may have been differences in the way EP studies were undertaken, different pacing sites, different stringency of um, extra stimuli, two versus three, different minimum coupling intervals. These may have all contributed and probably the populations were different with low event rates and short follow-up. But the, the non brigada individuals and, uh, got together and aggregated their data and, and looked at, at, uh, at different sorts of levels of risk from the drug-induced, non-inducible asymptomatic patient up to the uh, spontaneous symptomatic inducible patient. So that's from right to left on this uh, graph. But if we just look in the middle there um, at cases where we have um, uh, asymptomatic patients who have a spontaneous type 1 pattern and they're inducible versus non-inducible, there's a difference in risk there. The non-inducible having about 0.8% risk, while the inducible 1.7% risk. So it's being put forward that one may consider utilizing the EP study um, with two extra stimuli uh, from one location with a minimum permitted coupling interval of 200 milliseconds in the spontaneous type 1 pattern for risk stratification, it's a class 2B. Um, and one could consider a range of therapies, including ICD, uh, but others are also considering whether quinidine may be appropriate from that point of view. We can discuss that later if we wish. There are many alternative risk markers that have been looked at. Um, we do know that QRS fragmentation and early repolarization patterns seem to be the most consistent risk factors, as well as being Southeast Asian, and people have put forward different types of risk scores based on their own experience or based on the Shanghai score. And the higher your risk score, the better. But actually for the gray zone patient, when applied by the NOD group to their large population, the area under the curve is really not very good. 0.59, not great for, for assessing it. So you really can choose what you wish to do for the spontaneous uh, uh, type 1 patient and rely, uh, if you don't want to, on EP studies on, um, on other ECG characteristics and features in relation to risk and whether you use um, ICD therapy or you follow a patient up. But if you have an asymptomatic patient with a drug-induced sodium channel blocker pattern, just follow them up. There's no indication to proceed 
with, um, uh, with further risk stratification. There is the proviso, however, that this is the largest group of patients and it could harbour many sudden deaths that we've been uncertain about. So we still need to think hard about other ways of risk stratification in the future. In conclusion, um, risk stratification is still imperfect. We need better markers than the asymptomatic and EP studies remain a possible, a possible utility, although still hotly contested for the spontaneous type 1 patient. I think we're actually going to require gender, age and ethnic specific approaches. There are slides I haven't shown you from the SABRIS registry that suggests that as well. And there, um, there is a potential for looking at a new clinical ECG and EP genetic risk scores based on machine learning AI approaches. And I think that's where it will lie in the future. And if you're interested in Brigada Genetics, please think about joining ERA and the ECGen Focus Group. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you touching on the mechanism and strategy. We can be very, very traversed. We, we do have, have questions, questions in like the um, um, if it's possible, we would wish uh, uh, if you could join join or discuss discussion later on. Uh, uh, I'll just have to kind of.